Good morning, everyone. In just a few more seconds, we'll be kicking off today's Thriving in Business Uncertainty webinar series. We're just going to wait for a few more people to log on in. I am recording this webinar and it'll be available afterwards for anyone that joined late or wanted to see it later. All right, it's just a little bit uh, past the hour. Thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, we're super excited to be continuing the series on business uncertainty. Today we have a, a fantastic audience of panelists who are gonna share their personal stories. But before we get into those, uh, I'd like to just kind of walk, walk you through where we are in the series. So uh, first and foremost, you've got uh, business uncertainty. We raised this topic last week and uh, Megan Pierce from the city of Louisville did a great job really walking through what do we do now as it relates to grants and applications and uh, payroll and funding and loans. And um, she has a very exciting update on that, which she'll share uh, later in today's talk. But here we are now on series two. What have our peers done? Um, there's two more weeks of the series, uh, how to reinvent your business, as well as how to revive your social presence. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, a little bit more about um, the moderators for today. Uh, Wayne and I from Gambali Labs are really excited to be in partnership with the city and you know get a chance to get to all get to know all of you today. Um, we're business coaches and business advisors. And um, if you don't already have our information, maybe just use your phone take a picture of that information. You may need to reach us later with a quick question. Uh, we're happy to, to spend time with you uh, if you've got any, any needs and you just wanna chat. So a little bit more on me and my background um, and, and a snapshot here on a, on a future slide, I kind of walked through, but one of the things you really need to know about me as, as a background is um, I grew up in New England and um, did my education there at Babson. Babson is the number one school in the U.S. for entrepreneurship, almost two decades running. Um, I didn't just work in startups, I also worked in massive corporations, focusing on disruptive innovation and leveraging sea changes. We're all in this massive time of sea changes. And uh, one of the things that's really key on that is that when you think about sea changes that we're all going through, this is a, a, a great opportunity for all of us to, to harness uh, our inner strength as entrepreneurs. I've also worked in retail. I've worked in um, the food and beverage industry and have a lot of different backgrounds and I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to kind of introduce Wayne, who's also on my team. Wayne, take it from here. Hey, I appreciate it, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. We're super excited to have you guys here. So just a little bit about me. Um, I am the second half of Gambali Labs. We're so fortunate to be partnered with the city of Louisville uh, putting on this presentation. So I actually am an East Coaster, uh, moved out to Colorado from Virginia, where I grew up. Uh, originally actually born in Pretoria, South Africa, but started to disappoint, don't have an accent anymore since I've been here such a while. But my background is in marketing and branding and just business management. Uh, the past three years, I actually launched and grew a digital marketing agency doing everything from web development and lead generation, online advertising, all of that fancy technological mumbo jumbo that, uh, you know, those classic millennials like myself, I uh, think that they're good at. So if you guys ever need anything help in that realm, we're always here. And please, I just wanna go ahead and call out, there's a Q and A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the entire presentation today. Please drop questions in there. We'll have certain slides to ask questions as well, uh, but I'll actually be monitoring it throughout and bringing up questions to anybody as necessary. So thanks everybody for being here. I appreciate you. And just another shout out to the city of Louisville. Uh, we're really thankful for them 
as well as the, the Chamber of Commerce and the Downtown Business Association for inviting all of you here today and joining with us as well as your, your peer entrepreneurs in Louisville. So like I said, this is the four part series. Um, next up, I wanted just to kind of uh, tee up a little bit more about why this is so important. Um, but first, um, just a little bit of webinar logistics. We purposefully have all of you muted and your video silent so you can really focus in on uh, today's conversation. It will be recorded so you can get a link to that recording from GambaliLabs.com. Uh, and when you have a question, I just encourage you to chat it in when you think of it because you might uh, have another question that falls onto that later on. So just send them in to Wayne and I, um, send them in to the panelists as you think of them. And if we can't get to the question, uh, we will email the answers afterwards. So just a little bit more about why this matters. We've all been through major disruption in societal norms and business norms. Your mindset matters now more than ever. Um, you know, maybe you're a business owner, maybe you're a family provider, a citizen, a parent, a grandparent, or a combination of all of these. Um, through the last few weeks, you've probably been doing things like bootstrapping, bushwhacking, and trying to find a new way that just matters to get you through this storm. Um, a famous quote that I really love from Roger Babson from uh, where I went to school is, bite off more than you can chew and then chew it. I feel like we've all probably swallowed a lot over the last few weeks and months, and it's now time to digest that and navigate forwards. So before we get the chance to hear Liz and talk about um, what's going on here, I just kind of want to call out a moment of mindfulness for all of us. Um, call it a moment of silence, but just think about what matters most to you, relax yourself, maybe you've lost someone near and dear, maybe um, you're in a lot of business uncertainty, or you're just concerned about where things are. Let's just take 10 seconds to just uh, mentally reset ourselves and get ready for Liz. Great. Thanks everyone. Now that we're focused, I'd like to pass the baton off to Liz Connor of Fitter Patter and for her to share a, her story of walking through this very difficult time. Take it away, Liz. Thank you and thank you to our sponsors today. I think this is um, really important to be able to hear from our peers on what everyone's doing and maybe something that I say or someone else says could help you along your way because I'm certainly all ears to hear any suggestions. A little bit about um, my background. I own Pitter Patter, which is on the north end of Main Street in Louisville. I was born in Kentucky though. Um, I'm the daughter of a traveling salesman, so I mostly grew up in Kentucky. Um, I went to the University of Colorado, go Buffs, and I um, met my eventual husband there and um, I'm happy to be settled in Louisville. We've lived here now for nine years, which is the second longest I've lived anywhere. So I'm really kind of excited about that and happy to have my roots planting here. I have two daughters, ages five and nine, who attend Louisville Elementary. And like I said, um, married to my college sweetheart. I, um, before I owned a store, I was a um, senior producer at CNN International in the London Bureau. And before I got to that stop, I was hopscotching across the U.S. Um, working at various news affiliates doing the local news, deciding what you would see when you turned on the news at 6 and 11 o'clock at night. And that was a very exciting career, um, very challenging. And I guess in hindsight, it set me up for what we're dealing with right now because it really feels like I'm in a 24-hour news cycle with breaking news um, rolling coverage. So anyway, I... Um, stayed at home with my daughters for a few years when we moved to Louisville and realized that there are several families who were in the same boat that we were in looking for children's goods and it was hard to find in our area so that's why Pitter Patter started. So it opened in the fall of 2016 and since then the business has been growing very quickly and thriving and we've been well received but I'd say since the coronavirus hit um, we're not thriving anymore. We are um, struggling to survive and looking forward to a time when we can um, be on that upward um, 
growth pattern again. But right now we are embracing the changes that um, we have no choice about and trying to put a positive spin on it because the initial mindset was sink or swim. Um, having no customers come through the door and no staff here um, to help out is very daunting to every um, business owner. But since the shutdown in mid-March, um, we've had to retool and pretty much throw our old business plan out the window and come up with new ones overnight. And um, one of the things that we had to do as a brick and mortar, our um, foundation was an experience when you'd come into the shop. But fortunately, we had started a website about a year ago, as clunky and hard to navigate as it is, it was there. So overnight, we started moving all of our merchandise that we were allowed to, to our online platform. And I think starting like March 13th for about three weeks, we um, decided to offer like free shipping. At that time, I thought I would be selling clothing, which is cheap to ship. I learned very quickly um, that our customers, who are mostly families, are not interested in new clothing when we're sitting at home in our pajamas. And everybody um, was quickly learning that we were going to be in a homeschooling situation and we needed activities to keep children busy because they were driving us crazy as we we're trying to keep them safe at home. Um, so Pitter Patter took a big pivot and even though I am at my highest capacity of clothing inventory right now as we're about to change seasons, um, I needed to spend more money and that was daunting. Um, it was actually gut-wrenching and very hard for me to know the bills that were coming in for the clothing and the deliveries that were coming in with clothing um, had to be paid for, but I also needed to go spend more money on puzzles and activities, um, books and things to keep kids busy. So overnight I started retooling what we had to offer our customers. We also had Easter on the horizon. So um, the shutdown happened about a month before Easter. So I had to figure out what's a motivator for my customer to continue to shop with us. How could Pitter Patter stay relevant? So there was a huge push on our part to have as many Easter options, um, Easter gift options available as possible because we were hearing from our customers that they wanted to provide as much normalcy to their um, children as they could. And the Easter bread and coming to visit is a bright spot and Pitter Patter's all about celebrating milestones and happy occasions. So we wanted to be a part of that. Um, even though I knew that my spring summer inventory is likely a loss, um, I wanted to see what we could do to position Pitter Patter to be in a better spot for our fall winter, try to salvage what we could out of fall winter. Um, you've probably heard that the clothing retail um, business took a very hard hit in March, sales down 50% and April's likely to be worse. So um, we're aware of that information and trying to pivot. Um, so what surprised us on this journey of just a month that feels like a year is that our website does need a lot of improvements. I've been working behind the scenes with someone locally to help navigational challenges. I learned with the crazy amount of shipping that we started doing overnight that shipping label printers are worth the expense. Um, they're actually not too expensive. I had in my mind that they were like $500 or something and they're not, it's worth it. Um, the shipping cost that I have incurred over the three week free shipping period is insane. So we've gone back to the drawing board to figure out how can we make it as affordable as possible without losing our shirt. Um, in this whole panic process that we were going through, um, and I say we, it's me physically in the shop, but my staff at home has been as helpful as they can be with brainstorming solutions. But we um, were hearing consistently from our community that they want to support us. They want to support businesses in their zip code and the surrounding areas. And that's important to acknowledge. So we, um, are doing everything that we can to say thank you with every order that comes in. And they want to hear from us daily on social media. So um, what we started doing very quickly is leveraging our digital presence. And we had made this decision when we opened in 2016. If you go to the next slide, um, we knew that a, one easy way to get the word out about our business is through social media. It's free. So we started cultivating this online community of people who want to hear from us. So we leaned on that heavily once the shutdown happened. Oh, sorry. Um, 
I don't know how to stop that. But um, we decided that we needed to step up our daily postings on Instagram and Facebook. We usually do something daily, but we needed more of them. And um, I started drawing on my news background, which was behind the scenes, but um, utilizing all the things that I would teach new reporters and anchors about presenting on TV, I had to apply that to myself because I'm the face of this business and started doing um, Facebook Lives and Instagram TV daily when I could. And um, I would use those to show people what's in the store, what had arrived in deliveries, despite my trying to slow down the deliveries, they were already in process. So I might as well utilize um, those as an asset for the business and show people what's here. I also started offering virtual shopping appointments. So um, customers would contact us through um, Instagram, direct messages, Facebook, email, calling the store. They wanted to support us, but they wanted to see what we had. So I started setting up Facebook shopping appointments and um, taking emails from people who needed baby gifts or birthday gifts and would put together collections or ideas. That's what the one picture with the boys clothing is. Um, that mom needed new clothing for her son. So we put together ideas. I would take a picture. We would email them with links to our website and the customer could shop that way or they could reply to the email and say, this is what I want, bill me, which is great. Um, so as much inventory as we could move onto pitterpattershop.com um, is what we did. And that um, was one way that we were trying to make it easier for customers to support us because they couldn't come through the store. So that's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> I am running out of gas every single day, but I feel like there's not an option on um, you know, trying to keep this business afloat because there are bills to pay, of course, there's always bills to pay. And um, my employees really are the cornerstone of this business and I want them to have a store to come back and work in. They're a big part of our community and our customers have connected with our um, employees and they make Pitter Patter what it is. So I'm you know, spurred on by um, providing for them and also my family's support and encouragement has been huge. So I dig into those pockets every night to keep going, but it's hard. Um, I've learned a lot. In fact, every single day that I come into the shop um, during our limited hours to do our minimal business operation, there honestly has been something new to learn every day. It might just be how to operate that new shipping label printer or figuring out how to um, service a customer who's um, in an area that we don't typically ship to or there's just always something new. So um, I had to embrace that and lean on my staff, delegate, delegate, delegate. Um, positivity in our social media messages have been very well received. I mean, personally, I'm on um, an emotional roller coaster, but if I broadcasted that to our community, I had to make the conscious decision that that's not good for my business brand. Um, I'm not sweeping everything under the carpet. I'm acknowledging what we're all dealing with, but also trying to give a positive um, aspect to our customers' day when they tune into us on our social media. Also, um, all the rules that I had in place for Pitter Patter, like our standards, it has to be this way or that way, really needed to flex and be flexible. I had to um, kind of, well, I did make like a vendor um, naughty and nice list or um, report card who was working well for the business, who wasn't and had to cut some losses there. If a brand just wasn't performing, now's really the time to clean house and not order as much from them. I also, um, while running the shop and fulfilling orders, needed to start having serious conversation with vendors about terms, um, discounts for deliveries that you know I had committed to take. I've been placing orders six and eight months in advance. Those are contracts. But can we review those contracts since the vendor will be offering their goods on their website at 40% off, can they give me a break on what they're charging me because I also will need to um, run some sales? Can I get free shipping? All those questions are being asked daily. And um, I really had to get comfortable with accepting the word no from some of them, some of the vendors. And um, also decided that no is an answer and it's starting the conversation and I could go back and ask for more and that's okay. Um, 
the other source that helped me know what are some ideas to ask for from vendors and um, contracts that, that we're all in is a um, network of business owners. And I've always been members of different groups, but on Facebook, it seems that there is a group for every type of industry out there or brand that you're ordering. And I have made a wealth of new friends just in the past month who are virtual friends who are in business groups and they have so many ideas. So I would encourage everyone to leverage your other peers on um, ideas that they could offer on how to operate on, in this uncertainty. So that's what's working for Pitter Patter today. It seems like it might all change um, in about a week's time <laughs> when we start to reopen and we'll be assessing that every day too to figure out what works. Thanks, Liz, for covering all that. It sounds like you've changed so much with your business. Um, I'm really curious, what got you over that hump of doing the pivot to actually invest more in your business rather than decrease uh, your spending and investment? Like, how did you go through that? Walk us through it. Um, well, part of the process was what is available to order. Um, I had run vendor report cards on which brands um, that were non-clothing had worked for us in the past. So that data was very helpful to have a little bit of confidence on, okay, this brand performed well, um, is now a time to go through their catalog again, A, find out if they're shipping, because a lot of them couldn't ship. They were based in New York or LA, their warehouses, and those places were shutting down, you know, at different times than we were. So I had to figure out who could ship, were they brands that our customers liked? And could I bring in offerings that were different than what we've had before so that they were appealing? Um, then talking to my sales reps and brands about, hey, I need these goods, I can't pay for it right now. Um, my money's tied up in this other stuff. Could we get on a payment plan? So um, once I got some of those answers and once I started polling our customers on social media, hey, what are you looking for? Just asking the customers, how can we help you? Um, that gave me a little bit more confidence to say, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and bite the bullet. But my first order was small. And then I found out I was selling through the goods before they even arrived in the shop. So the next morning I'm on the phone again and placing another order and then trying to figure out how soon can it get here. Some of our vendors went into a drop ship mode. So that was helpful. So I didn't actually have to receive the goods at the store. I could be the conduit to take the orders and send those on to the vendor. And then the vendor would ship directly from their warehouse. And that was a game changer for um, this little shop because just the lag and getting goods into this new goods into the store that I hadn't placed orders for months in advance, that was a process. But um, I you know, called my credit card company and asked for an increase. You know, I'm, I'm gonna need to lean on that credit card a little bit more and it, it worked. <laughs> um, it was scary though too. And when there was one day 14 boxes arrived and one day I needed a margarita at the end of that day um, because I'm unpacking it all and I'm putting labels on it. And then really hopeful that when I go and broadcast it to our Instagram followers and our Facebook followers and our VIP Facebook followers, that I had actually picked goods that they wanted and they were so receptive and so helpful. Um, and they bought what I was selling and then they asked for more. So that gave me the confidence to say, um, I think we're on the right path. And now I'm listening again because everyone has the puzzles that they need now. So what's the next thing that we can help with? And that's really, that speaks to the um, kind of ethos of what Pitter Patter is. We're here to help. Great. Those are some key takeaways. It sounds like you figured out what was available, what would sell, and you're constantly listening to your customers to figure out what's next, what do they need going forwards. Um, I guess my, my next follow-up question for you is how has your mindset changed through all of this? Because it sounds like there's just so many things that happen, but what's that new mindset that you're in that you think is gonna help you and your peers navigate going forwards? Because it's not gonna be snap or back in business. It's gonna be a rough road still. Yeah. I've talked to some other business owners in town and it seems that um, we are all at different phases in what um, mindset we currently are are taking on. Um, I think my news background, which um, gave me a real sense of, you know, you dig in 
when the news happens, you run to it and you start reporting and um, spreading the news. Um, that gave me a foundation of, I knew I had the reserves in me. I also needed to encourage my staff and you know, we're all personally trying to figure out what our reaction is to this news, but um, my staff might not react the same way I did. So constant check-ins with them on how are you feeling? Are you okay to be at the shop? Is now the time that we should just say nobody else at the shop? Um, that gave me a barometer of what's okay to ask for. But um, some business owners in town said, oh, they um, wanted to pull the covers over their head, you know, as soon as the shutdown was announced and just think about it for a bit. And I had the opposite reaction. That hit me the second week of the shutdown. <laughs> Once I realized how hard this is and um, how much work there is to be done, I gave myself a little bit of space and said, I just need to stop for a few days and um, kind of, Put things back into perspective and do some self-care but the fear is present every day what's going to happen next um and that's paralyzing in several ways and then i'll get a nice um comment from a customer or a request from a customer and so it, there, in a way the business has been a distraction from the personal fear um until i get that next bill in the mail <laughs> yeah just take it day by day. And I've also um, learned that I have to pace myself because the first week was insanely um, busy just trying to reorganize everything and figure out what what our response was going to be. Great. Uh, just checking in with Wayne. Um, Wayne, are there any questions that have come in so far or do we need to kind of hold them off to the end for, for Liz? Yep. So only one question is coming. We're going to hold it off until the end because I think everybody might have some great opinions on the matter. So I think we're ready to move forward. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. And now we have Melissa Williams of Yoga Junction sharing her story. Take it away, Melissa. Thank you, Mark. Um, let's see. I've been living in Louisville since 2005. Uh, when I say that out loud, it seems really surprising because as Liz was saying, I'm realizing I've lived here and in this house for longer than any other house. But um, my husband and I moved here from Santa Barbara. I'm originally from Montana. Um, and prior to owning the studio, uh, I was a yoga teacher, but that was kind of my side gig. I was the uh, editorial director for a spa magazine. And so I traveled around the world um, visiting spas and writing about that experience and really learning a lot about the wellness industry. Um, and so, however, in, let's see, I think it was 2000 and, I don't know, six, the, the uh, magazine flipped to being online. And so my kind of shift happened between having yoga being a part-time thing and the magazine being a full-time thing to the magazine being a little thing and the yoga being a big thing. And so um, I worked at a studio here for a little while and then in 2011, I opened Yoga Junction. And I live here in Louisville with my husband who I met in college, also college sweethearts, and my two daughters that are uh, 12 and nine. And my older daughter goes to Monarch Middle and my younger daughter is at Fireside. <laughs> um, and I, I think the other, the thing that I am noticing, I need to go kind of off of the slide. So I apologize off of that. Um, but what I found during this time is that I function best with, um, optimism. I think Liz was saying, you know, it's not that she's trying to kind of put everything underneath the rug, but it's more that if I dwell in what was, um, I can't seem to move forward. And so I'm really excited to share what we've done to change. Uh, we flipped our entire model in about 24 hours, um, which I think most of the businesses did. Um, so at first, that first week, or the first few weeks in March, when it was clear that uh, we needed to address the issue, we started with, I think, the same measures that a lot of businesses did, which was enhanced cleaning. As a yoga studio, we're not a heated studio, so we don't have a lot of necessary like sweat and things inside this space, but we do have a lot of shared 
tools, whether it's yoga blocks, yoga mats, we took away all the borrow mats so nobody could borrow anymore. Um, and then we were cleaning all of the props as much as we could, obviously cleaning, you know, the doorknobs and things like that. Um, as that seemed like that wasn't gonna be enough of a measure, I started to look into on-demand classes, which are classes that are on demand. So they're filmed in advance and students can then access them online. The problem is there's a huge market already there for this and they're filmed by professional videographers. And trying to get a videographer into our space in the midst of this is impossible. Um, and I don't have that skill set. So the on demand quickly went out the door. And we then decided to switch to live stream, which I really didn't quite understand what we were doing at first, how that was going to be different than on demand. And I am so grateful to have it because it feels much more like a regular yoga class as opposed to a video that you're watching where you have no connection. So our live stream classes, you still see your teachers, you still see your students. The students can interact with each other at the beginning of class. So for me, as the teacher, when I join in, it's a sense of community. I get the same, I mean, not the exact same sense, but I get a sense of having my students all together and they can ask each other questions and I can ask them what they need instead of it being, you know, on, in an on-demand situation, I would have just kind of pre prescribed what we were gonna do and then not really been able to adapt. So, um, all right, so what surprised us the most? Uh, using Zoom um, and then having Zoom be all over the news uh, every other day with uh, <laughs> security measures. So that's been really um, interesting is just learning how to use that platform. It's super easy, obviously we're on it right now. Um, and it's a lot easier than diving again into the on-demand, but um, I, I found that was a transition, especially for somebody that doesn't consider themselves very tech-centered. Um, I have to say though, I think what I was surprised the most by was the enthusiasm of the community. Um, we sent out a survey probably a week before we were actually closed, asking whether they would be interested in shifting everything online. And I was really nervous about what that was gonna look like. And 99% of the responses said, yes, we will participate if you shift. And then I'm like, okay, well, they said yes on the surface. Will they really show up in classes? So our very first class that we had, um, and actually, if you see these slides, it's the teacher in the bottom right, Jen Soule. Um, she taught our very first Zoom class on a Saturday afternoon at four, and we had 30 plus people join in, which is actually more bodies than we can have in our studio. So that was um, a very, I was in class as a student, and it was a very heartwarming, heart, I mean, most of us were in tears. It just felt really good to feel that supported. Um, the other thing that surprised me a lot is that this platform has enabled us to reach students that couldn't take class otherwise. So we've had uh, mothers and daughters from across the country. We have one student that invited her two colleagues in London to join in. We've had people that have moved away that you know miss maybe some of their favorite teachers or they miss the students or the studio and they've been joining in. Um, and so I think that capacity to see that we can do something different and it's actually great. It's not lesser than what we were doing before um, has been really inspiring. Um, as I just said, I think what keeps us going for all of the teachers, especially because we're not getting the community aspect in person is just seeing people show up. And we have students that are, and I guess I should have said this previously, but we have people that have been intimidated to try yoga, trying it now because they feel less like they're, you know, in a group. We have a lot of times, and I'm not trying to stereotype here, but we have a lot of husbands joining in with their wives because suddenly their wives are practicing in the living room. And then, you know, he's like, well, you know, they can't really see me. My husband, in fact, is joining in and he wasn't taking classes before. So, um, I find that really inspiring. Um, and then also just the gratitude. And Liz, I think, mentioned this as well, but people are reaching out on um, social media and they're reaching out in emails and they say it at the beginning or end of class, just how grateful they are to have this space and this place to return to, even though it's in a new way, it's still the comfort of their practice. Um, and so that's been inspiring for all of us. 
Uh, okay, so digital. I have somebody that does our social media because social media is just not in my forte. Um, I've always been a writer and I can write things on the back end, but then getting it into the social world has been a little bit um, more of a challenge for me. So I do have somebody that's doing that and she has increased the frequency of both our Facebook and Instagram messaging. She's also had all of the teachers rally in so that in order for messages to be seen, we're all reposting, retweeting, sharing, etc. cetera. Um, we've been using the Canva marketing um, design platform, um, which is unbelievable for those of you that, like myself, can't really design something on their own. Um, and so that's enabled us to have digital that's a little bit more fresh. Um, and then as kind of like what I was saying before about this has actually opened the door for new things, we've been able to add some classes that wouldn't have been a hit um, in person. So for instance, the one that's on the screen right now is this restorative yoga pajama party. And yes, some people might've showed up at the studio in their pajamas to do yoga, but I think everybody still would have, you know, had their makeup on or their hair back or whatever. And like, it wouldn't have really been that experience. And so um, we decided to throw out this idea of like, show up in your pajamas, like you don't have to have the screen on, do what you want. And it's been really well received. Um, and so we've been kind of adding more things in that regard of um, classes that perhaps we couldn't have done at the studio. We have another, um, we had TRX at the studio, which if you're not familiar, um, you use these straps and they provide resistance to the body. And um, we had a capacity in the studio because our studio is really small. We only have a thousand square feet. Um, so we shifted that entire thing to a more weight-based workout, no straps because most people don't have them. And the class has doubled in size from where it was in studio. Um, and people are really, more people are attending the early morning classes than they were before because I think the most, People were intimidated or didn't want to get up that extra half hour early to get dressed and then drive to the studio and show up for a 6 a.m. or 6.30 a.m. class. I mean, there's a select few that did, but now we've got people that are like, oh, I can make 6.30 if that means I get out of bed at 6.20, you know? it's It's been a shift and I think that, um, that being able to be accommodating to how people are showing up and what, what is working well and what's not um, has been key. Um, okay, so top lessons learned uh, evolving, I think is probably the biggest one and one that we use a lot in the yoga world, um, just within the asana practice, the physical poses and whatnot. Um, I, prior to shifting everything to everybody teaching from their homes, I wouldn't put a workshop on on the schedule without a few months marketing um, lead time. We wouldn't change the schedule, but four times a year. Um, I really strive in having consistency. I feel like students really appreciate that. However, now that we're in this mode, I had to adapt and realize that people will still show up if I tell them 48 hours in advance. It's, it's not the same lead time um, that I needed before. And I've also needed to realize that, as I mentioned before, the class everyone's routine is so different. So before like evening classes were popular and they're not anymore. Everybody's at 6 p.m. ready to have their margarita or dinner or whatever. It's not, you know, the yoga isn't happening, but they are wanting to show up at 6.30 a.m. or 9.30 a.m. And so just kind of being willing to acknowledge what isn't working and acknowledge that I can't just shift everything that was in studio to Zoom. It had to be a mindset. I also learned that longer classes don't work very well from a home space and I knew that in advance because most of us, I'm a mother, uh, get distracted by something, whether it's our children or our pets or that we should have vacuumed before we put down our yoga mat or whatever it is. I realized that having it be 75 or 90 minutes made people kind of wander and so really condensing and um, putting a lot into a short amount of space was really important. Um, Patience. So, I, as I said before, um, I'm not a tech person, and I realized very quickly it's a lot to expect from the Wi-Fi with Zoom. And so, I um, I think it was my second class I was teaching. I got kicked out of my own class um, and had to join back in. And thankfully, they were all still there and they were still in a pose, and they just thought that I had, you know, made them suffer for two minutes while I checked out for a little while. But um, 
recognizing that the students are okay with that, they're not judging us, um, and that they're okay with as we kind of navigate this online world. Um, and then trusting, you know, I, I am nervous to reopen, to be honest. I feel like in the fitness space, we just, it's, it, we, you know, we can't just have one student come into the studio and have a yoga class. I mean, that's a private, we can do that, but it's not the same thing as a community class. And so I am hesitant to reopen until I feel like we can comfortably have bodies together. Um, and then it doesn't mean a packed room, but um, I want to know that I'm not putting my teachers or my students at risk when we do reopen. Um, and we may reopen and still offer the live stream. I mean, if if people are enjoying being able to practice from their homes and not necessarily come to the studio space, I think this is a new uh, format that we will, instead of just ditching when we don't need it anymore, I think we're gonna try to embrace it and figure out how to have the two coexist. Melissa, I'm glad you had a chance to kind of share that story with us. Um, a few things came to mind. Um, you talked just about mindset talked about engagement and actually asking your current customers if we go online will you follow us what got you to get to that point where you felt like you could ask that and you weren't afraid of the answers because um, I heard that same theme from from Liz as well asking what do you need now to get to that point where you could do it because you did share that technology isn't something that you routinely use or feel super comfortable with I, I honestly just felt like I was okay with whatever the answer was going to be. I needed to hear it from the students. My gut was telling me, so this, the, like I said, the, the email survey went out a week before we formally closed. We closed the same day the kids went home from school, which at this point I don't remember the date, March 13th, 14th-ish or something like that. So I sent it out about a week before when I still had this little glimmer of optimism that we might be able to stay open with some sort of modifications in the studio. But my gut was telling me that we needed to shift online. And I, the students really just kind of pushed me into feeling okay to make that choice. And then I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on that capacity shift idea that you mentioned. It sounds like in some of your classes, like the morning ones, you have way more people than you ever had in the morning and your business model almost seems like it's forever shifted and you might not go back to the old standard. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's difficult as a, a service-based business. You know, I know we have some classes when we ask people to sign up in advance because we know that it's gonna be mat to mat. It's gonna be packed and we have to turn people away. And so I look at that and I'm like, oh, well, if we had a bigger space, we'd be able to accommodate them. But the cost of rent to accommodate more students for a handful of classes a week that are at that size doesn't weigh out financially. So I think that, you know, I don't know yet what this is gonna look like, but I think being able to have the ability to have some students in studio and some students live stream might be an option where it's one class simultaneously, or we may just have two like separate schedules running, which would actually enable me to have two different kinds of classes offered at the same time. So at this point, I don't know what that's going to look like. I, um, I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around what the, how we're going to evolve, um, moving into reopening, but it is something that, um, and, and I have a lot of students that are preferring this mode too. And, and I'd say most students prefer to be in the studio. They like to leave their homes and go and practice in a space. So it's not like this is our new norm, but I'm trying to figure out how to accommodate both of those needs. Definitely a difficult challenge to navigate. And, and I think that resonates with um, what others have shared as well, what Liz has shared in terms of getting through this new normal and, and riding this wave. Uh, thanks, Melissa, for sharing your story. Um, let's switch over to Andy and uh, hear his talk, and uh, then we'll open it up for questions at the end. Uh, thanks, Andy, for joining us today. Um, all you need to do is um, unmute yourself and then start sharing your story. Great, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm gonna read off the screen here. 
when he was 17, in spite of his bad attitude and long hair. Oh, geez, who wrote that? Mark, was that you? No, that's right from your website. Oh, that's right. Okay. So, uh, I'm Andy. I live here in Louisville with my three boys and my wife. We are not college sweethearts, but we're we're still deeply in love all the same. Um, opened up Moxie five years ago after um, a pretty long career in the corporate world. That uh, in, initially coming from a small from from small private um, local neighborhood bakeries um, and getting kind of jumping into the deep waters of the corporate world for over 15 years. Uh, and, and recognizing that I really, as much as I enjoyed the fast pace and, and um, uh, the wild ride of, of being at Whole Foods Market for those many years, I just yearned for uh, customer interaction and, and, and to work closely with the staff uh, on a daily basis, not on spreadsheets and PowerPoints. And um, so that's where Moxie came from. And um, I think I heard Melissa use a word that was Heart, heartwhelming. I think it's a uh, heartwarming and overwhelming put together, and that's giving me a word of the month. Um, when we opened Moxie five years ago in June, um, we were we were pretty busy from the onset, and I, I was so nervous leaving you know the corporate world and thinking that I didn't have the skill set to do a small uh, business, and how would I possibly deal with all of the challenges that come with being a small business owner. And it all kind of worked out, you know, and, and there's some, there were some huge blind spots and there's always these uh, immense uh, op grow such as this pandemic. Um, and, you know, I, I, we, we've, made a, um, we've made a habit of hiring really creative, dynamic uh, employees, um, in part because um, I think it's, uh, I, I enjoy being around really uh, inspiring, um, dynamic, creative, artistic people. And I think they interact really well with our community and our customers. Um, what I didn't know was how well they would adapt to this crazy situation that we're in. And, you know, when we started hearing reports about um, uh, COVID-19, I was, I was in Austin, Texas, uh, with our head head Miller Joan and we were interning at a flour mill learning how to uh, be professional millers instead of uh, hobby millers and a friend had just come back from uh, Asia and with, was talking about you know, you know this um, this flu or this pandemic and I was like oh god that sounds like crazy conspiracy theory and by the time we you know landed back on Colorado soil it was starting to gain speed and um, we saw our sales dipping at the bakery. And, um, you know, we, we were like, Jesus, you know, what, this is crazy, what do we do? You know, it's kind of, nobody's walking the streets, you know, there's some kind of murky guidance coming down from the federal government. Um, and we started to, you know, rethink our business model. Um, the first thing that, that popped up for us was, um, gosh, should we even be operating? Is this irresponsible to try to, you know, feed people? And I struggled with that, as did a lot of my team, um, for that first week or two. And there's a lot of static out there, um, a lot of really strong opinion uh, from all camps, you know, some, some restaurant owners were were being put on, on record, you know, in interviews to saying, you know, shutting down is the only choice, you know, do you, you know, do your community a, a favor and shut down. That's what you should do. Um, you know, some pretty passionate, almost bombastic, um, uh, you know, points of view on, on national headlines as well. And, you know, other local people saying, you know, oh, we're going to dig in and we're going to, or other, other folks in the restaurant industry saying, you know, we're going to dig in and we're going to push through and, and we're gonna keep feeding people, um, and then kind of everything in between. And so, you know, I was on kind of daily calls with uh, Trent from Pika, and Mike at Little Horse, and Eric at uh, Acme Fine Goods, and a lot of uh, local business um, entrepreneurs, just trying to understand if we should, you know, should we just shut down? Is that the right thing to do? So I guess 
the history of our, you know, where how we got to where we are was struggling with that decision because, you know, I'm not so proud of the fact that we can survive this pandemic as a business that I want to put our community or our staff at risk. So, you know, we, we talked to our staff. I read, you know, state, national, and global news and tried to understand uh, what COVID-19 was and how to deal with it and how to, uh, if you were going to stay open because we're considered a, uh, you know, an essential business, how would you do it without putting your staff or your customers, um, you know, at risk? And, we, you know, we made a, a side softly resolute, uh, you know, um, commitment to pushing through and, be, and, re and remaining open. Um, and we started adding some uh, protocols for our staff and our customers. Um, you know, every customer comment that I got via our website or verbally, um, I, I, I took in a, a ton of time to evaluate the feedback, um, think about how, how we needed to act on that feedback. So. You know, one feedback was, uh, you know, this, and this was three weeks ago. Um, you know, you guys are putting people at risk. There's a line outside. There's people hanging out like it's a happy Saturday afternoon. You know, you can't be doing this. You know, um, and that very day we were we were in queue to print uh, a sign that said, "Hey, here's our new rules. You know, walk up only and delivery only. Um, you know, please social distance. Uh, we're doing." Con service so on and so forth um, and so I took that feedback and I went out and our general manager um, I actually got the feedback via a phone call from a friend who was very upset and you know he's like my wife came to pick up a lasagna and it was a you know chaos out there and, uh, so I called my general manager and I said all right go and measure out six foot increments and, and put duct tape on the sidewalk because you know we, we we are responsible for, uh, or I feel responsible for, making sure that our, our customers are keeping each other safe. I can't tell them what to do, but I can certainly try to provide um, some guidance, right? So uh, we did that, and then we kept stepping through different levels of um, sort of food safety protocol. You know, now we all wear masks. We asked our staff to be on a, on a stay-at-home order before uh, Governor Polis did. Um, the reason being, if, if, if our staff were out doing whatever they may be doing uh, and got infected and came in and infected somebody at the bakery, then, you know, it's game over. And uh, all of our employees um, wanted to keep working if we could, you know, if we could make it safe. And they were all looking to me for assurances that, hey, you know, you're making this safe, you know. So, um, so that's the the kind of the, um, you know, uh, how to modify how we modified our business to be at a spot that we feel we are as safe as we could possibly be for ourselves and our customers. Um, as far as the changing business model of uh, running a bakery cafe. Well, we're not a bakery cafe. We are now a Moxie supply company. So we sell things like toilet paper, dried beans, um, vodka, uh, lasagna platters, um, books, uh, uh, eggs, produce. And um, and it's awesome and it's super fun. And, you know, I, I had a pretty major shift in my, my kind of ego around who I am and what I do when I opened Moxie five years ago because I was always Andy the baker, you know? It's kind of like when you become a father, and it's like, you know, it's like, well, you know, so what do you do? You're like, well, I'm a dad. Oh, and I'm a scientist, you know? And for me, it was like, I'm a baker. I'm such a proud baker. Let me tell you how many loaves of bread I can bake. And, um, and we opened Moxie and it, it became clear that Moxie was more about community than bread. And I kind of, you know, I shifted out of being this sort of, uh, I hesitate to say macho baker, but you know, um, uh, that that was how I defined myself. And so that was an interesting transition to become, you know, a community, you know, uh, a, a helper in the community rather than Andy the baker. And with this pandemic, now it's 
it's like, I don't really care what I'm selling as long as it's of value and people, um, and it's helping uh, our business and our community. So uh, I proudly sell uh, two ply toilet paper for a buck a roll or a buck 50 or whatever it is. And, and you know, great mid-priced red wine for 15 bucks a bottle. Um, we, 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 as my whole team is very much on board with it too. And everybody is just kind of beaming and shining that um, we are able to provide a service that seemingly um, is needed. Uh, I think part of why it's needed is that, um, you know, there is a, a higher comfort level with coming and sitting, you know, on Main Street in six foot intervals to get a bottle of wine, lasagna, a latte, and some beans than there is going into a, you know, big box supermarket uh, with lots and lots of other people, you know, touching stuff in there and hanging out. So, um, am I supposed to follow the slide, Mark? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, I did that one, that one, that one, that one. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, dinner sales. So, we, we love cooking food, and every now and then, we you know, when we do our pizza nights, we do uh, kind of prepared foods, you know, multi-course meals. Um, now we are doing full, um, you know, foil uh, sheet pans, uh, like casserole, of lasagna and pot pie and chicken dinner. Uh, we're trying to make it a, you know, something that will feed a family of four, six. And we're also trying to uh, do some kind of value added uh, extras, whether it's garlic bread or salad or, you know, some steamed vegetables. Um, you know, part of that is to deliver a full meal solution. And part of that is to hit a $50 ticket, because if we're able to um, get a $50 ring, that's a substantial, um, uh, you know, daily financial in incremental ring. You know, you do 10 of those and you're at 500 bucks and you just paid for, you know, buy people's you know paycheck and um, we're, we're, we're trying to make sure we balance the um, the value of that you know so like our pot pie is almost five pounds so it's like huge um, and we hope that that value is is um, uh, commensurate with the uh, price tag on it um, you know being able to sell beer and wine has been tremendous uh, we, we nobody has come to moxie historically for beer, wine, or cocktails. I think we're more of a family, uh, you know, more family place to bring kids, not necessarily guzzle beer, but it's a great add-on, you know. Um, it's it's kind of beautiful in a French way to see somebody buy a baguette and a bottle of red wine and some butter, you know. Like, I wanna go follow them and see if they're just like hanging out in the park, you know, with that. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so, um, you know, I feel kind of crass and bombastic, you know, even saying this, you know, you can either lay down and die or stand up and fight. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, my observation of, of businesses throughout um, the US anyway, uh, I know a lot of folks who are in fine dining who pivoted. Um, Annette uh, in Denver and Aurora at the Stanley Marketplace is an amazing, uh, you know, James Beard award-winning chef. Um, she serves beautiful, yummy, fancy food. And um, most fine dining establishments weren't able to pivot. You know, nobody's buying $400 bottles of French wine and, you know, caviar right now. But but Caroline Glover of Annette pivoted, you know. Um, Duncan and Allie, who run um, uh, Call in Rhino, same, you know, they, they I think they were on the top 10 list for Bon Appetit's uh, best new restaurants last year. So very, very nice fancy food. They also pivoted and they figured out how to, um, you know, modify and they're, they're figuring it out, right? It's, uh, it's super tough and there are no rules and you got to figure it out as you go and it's dicey. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it, it's encouraging to see uh, folks who, you know, may otherwise, I, I don't know, folks in tricky situations.
a bit like that. And uh, I think um, a lot more uh, restaurants and, and bakeries and cafes, if they were, if they if they were so inclined, um, you know, could could pivot. You know, it, it, you can't be too too proud to sell TP. Everybody uses it, right? Um, so that said, um, I definitely run out of gas like every ten days or so. Um, I, I literally get home, and I think the the emotional weight of of trying to be, uh, you know, positive and um, you know, it's almost like being a uh, ambulance, you know, an EMT driving around, you know, with with um, doing triage all day. Emotions are really high, you know. Customers that um, may otherwise uh, dislike something that happened. And, or, you know, hey, my latte is too cold, or, you know, you, you forgot to, you, you know, only got one croissant, but you charge them for two. Um, you know, you're seeing people come unglued more. You know, people are people are pretty, are running pretty hot, and they're pretty freaked out. And so having to field customer um, uh, feedback, that's very emotionally charged. And, and then just trying to keep staff, you know, um, you know, be that sort of positive, you um, uh, beacon that both Melissa and Liz talked about is super important, but it definitely is exhausting. So yeah, by every 10 days I go home and get in the bath at like three or four o'clock and I crack a beer and I put on like Joni Mitchell and light a candle. And then by five o'clock I've been in my bed almost to sleep, you know, and then I sleep for about 10 hours to wake up and I'm ready to rock again. Um, so that's my recharge and that's all I got. Oh, sorry. Leveraging digital. Um, we we did Instagram and Facebook updates. Um, started doing um, you know Square Square marketing. If anybody out there uses Square Point of Sale, uh, which I know a lot of people do, you know whether you're just using that little dinky reader that you pop on your phone, or you're read it, you're using the uh, iPad setup, or their fancy new proprietary software. Um, when you, you can come in and drop, when you, um, you can come in, hold on one second. Yeah. It may be noisy here. One second. When, um, when you use square part of their, uh, actually I might do a brief, brief pause here. Hold on. So when you use Square, um, you know, they have all these different add-on services um, that are relatively inexpensive. And one of them is called Square Marketing. And Square Marketing um, can allow you to do email blasts to all of your customers. Uh, basically, anybody who's ever come in and used a credit card to pay for a transaction and that has, um, you know, their email connected to that, or if they've ever signed up to be on your newsletter, you can use the square marketing function to email them. So in the past, we would do, you know, one for Mother's Day, hey, here's their special, or hey, we're closed on Christmas, and I was incredibly cautious not to blow up people's inboxes with clutter. And uh, and now I am cluttering it like nobody's business. And I decided right when the proverbial, uh, whatchamacallit, hit the fan, we would communicate wh what we were doing, what we were doing to be safe, how we were going to operate our business, what new products we were adding um, in the form of a daily update. And it's uh, so it started out as kind of, um, you know, hey, we're wearing masks and oh, by the way, we've got a new sticky bun. Uh, and then it turned into, you know, hey, we've got masks and a sticky bun. Oh, and here's a cool song that this friend of ours wrote, you know. And then I started getting carried away and just rambling about anything that I felt was positive and would provide a kind of distraction, you know. Um, uh, and, I, and I actually stopped mentioning COVID after like the first three days. I was like, I'm not going to use that word. Um, I'm just going to say, hey, once this craziness blows over or, or, or 
or whatever, and I put up pictures of my kids, you know, snuggling a bunny rabbit, or um, I didn't even know what, but, uh, and it's gotten really good feedback, um, and, you know, the, the biggest feedback we get are people saying, hey, it is so nice to have just a little dose of normal every morning um, with all the, you know, classic scare, scare news, not even fake news, just scare news of, of the global, um, you know, new, news stuff. So, yeah. Was there more slides? Top lessons. Pivot fast. Yeah, if you haven't pivoted yet, uh, I would recommend you think about it. Um, you know, Melissa said that in 24 hours, she had thought up a new business model. Um, you know, it took us 25 hours. Um, she beat us to the punch. Uh, and I'm totally petrified of doing yoga in a group too. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to hop on online where nobody can see me. But, um, I think it took us about a week to pivot. It took us a couple days to decide, you know, to, for, for the whole mercantile uh, supply shop concept to kind of come in. And then we started um, uh, using our point of sale system. They rapidly added on like a delivery feature and a delivery time and do you want to tip the driver and, and all of these bells and whistles that had really not been a part of the program. So, you know, that was huge. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I don't have cash. Don't have, you know, we, we stopped doing cash a long time ago and we just have made our, our interactions to completely um, contact us. So we're wearing latex gloves, packing everything, get everything set up. Um, so if you can be fully safe doing it, you know, that's, that's uh, one of the biggest things. Great. Thanks, Andy, for sharing that. Yep. And now uh, Megan's going to share a, an update from the city on the grant program. Hey, everyone. Um, you've probably you've probably heard. Um, I'm Megan Pierce. I'm the Economic Vitality Director for the city. Um, appreciate you being on this webinar and taking time, um, you know, to to think about shifting and and how to adapt a mindset during this very difficult time. So I just want to speak very briefly. Um, we've put out quite a bit of information this week and it will continue to be out there on our emergency solutions grant program. So that was adopted by city council on Friday um, and applications opened at eight o'clock this morning. Um, probably my main message um, so far, just to so people aren't scared um, and my inbox is still exploding, but it is not a first come first serve grant program. So being in the system first doesn't give you any more weight than the person that's 100 125th in the system. It's a basis of eligibility and criteria that was all adopted uh, by the city council. So um, we're happy to see so many applications coming in, um, you know, so we'll wait until everything comes in. We're reviewing it um, during the three-day period and then next week really uh, sorting through and, and determining um, with those eligibility and criteria. Um, how many people we can get funded. I, I certainly believe that we will have more applications than we have funding available, um, you know, despite uh, the city council adopting some, some eligibility factors to, to limit the pool and, and try and help those small businesses, you know, most impacted by what's been going on. So we, they are $5,000 grants. We have funding for 70 of those. Um, we had about 115 applications so far this morning. Uh, that's not speaking to eligibility. So I encourage everyone to go on the website, read about what makes you eligible and what the criteria are. Um, and I'm answering questions as they come in. So call or email me if you're not sure. Um, about something that's in the application. And then I'm also making an effort to review everything um, as quickly as I can, just to make sure that people have complete applications. So, you know, another message to be really clear on is that if it's incomplete, we can't review it as part of the process because we are gonna get so many applications. So everything's gotta come through our website form and, and needs to be complete and signed off on. So um, really glad that we have this opportunity out there, but 
uh, this webinar and, and other platforms are also a good way to share with us other ideas you have about how we can help support small businesses. This is this is one thing that we're doing for our local business community. Um, I know that we've been doing others and will continue to do others. This is just a current focal point. Great. Thanks, Megan, for sharing that really positive update with everyone. Uh, so what I'd like to do at this point is move ahead to the next slide and kind of just do a, a quick reminder. Um, so uh, you're at the second point in the webinar series and if questions have come up and you definitely want to spend time uh, with Wayne and myself um, and if you're not sure how to pivot, plan or progress in this time or deal with your website or your social media piece, that's something that we um, do daily and weekly for clients in the Louisville area. So definitely uh, reach out to us. We're here to help, or help you make this transition. So um, definitely reach out. And then uh, kind of moving forwards too on the next steps here uh, on the next slide is one of the things that we'd really like to do for you now is to answer any questions that have come in. Uh, we'll certainly give the webinar link out to people um, and that content will be on gumbalilabs.com, the recording. My contact information is here. Megan's is here as well. What I'd like to do now is uh, open it up. And Wayne, have you seen any key questions come in that we absolutely want to ask the panel or address for the audience right now? Yeah, so the first first question was asked um, uh, while Liz was speaking, but I think Liz, both you and Melissa can touch on it. Uh, essentially, it was asking, you know, how did you pivot to doing Facebook Lives and Instagram TVs in terms of more logistics, meaning lighting, makeup, et cetera? If there's any advice or resources that you guys could share? Sure, I can speak to that. Um, the building where Pitter Patter is operating has horrible lighting. Um, so I tested a few things, some shots without sending it out just to see where could people see the product the best. And um, it's kind of where I'm sitting right now. Like I set up right in front of our big window that usually has a display in it or some kind of decoration, but we can get light through there. So I'd say first find out where you can um, showcase your goods the best and take a picture of it. You can see a lot more once you take a picture of what you want to show. You'll find those details that stand out to your eye that your customer will notice too. So fix those things. Um, <clears throat> so far as changing from like a still format to video to live, sometimes it was just out of necessity where I knew I had to get home to pick up the homeschooling, home learning process from my husband. So I just had a few minutes. It might be easier just to be transparent um, click the live button on Facebook and not allow myself to edit and re-edit and shoot five times and just get the message out there because I was feeling pressure like I needed to communicate something faster. We had also started doing Facebook live sales, um, I'd say about six months before this hit and they would be random on Sunday night for our Facebook VIP group. If you don't have a Facebook group. It is a way for you to target um, your followers who want to be a part of your group to make sure that they see your posts um, frequently because there's an algorithm in Facebook that limits what people can see when. So um, we had cultivated this Facebook group. I would do live shots there and they were rough and um, I had to make sure that it was um, that I got comfortable kind of making a goofball of myself or when I would mess up, just tell um, whoever's watching, oh, whoops, I need to do this or the phone's ringing or whatever. People like that transparency and they're very forgiving. So I got comfortable with that. And sometimes if I had a product that had um, wording on it, like a book, if I was doing a live shot, it seemed that um, the image would be backwards. Um, like, you know, you're looking in the mirror. If I shot it in video, the image would be corrected. So I would think about what product I was um, showcasing and what platform would show the product the best. And trial and error, a, a lot of trial and error. But uh, it's okay to make mistakes, especially now. People are really forgiving on what the social media content looks like and you'll get better with practice, that old saying. Thanks, Liz. Melissa, anything to add? I don't really have anything to add since I'm not the one doing the Facebook Live or the Instagram on my end. I mean, we're filming, but we're not filming for um, 
social media. Beautiful. That's fine. I'll just reiterate what Liz said. Um, when it comes to social media, when it comes to Facebook lives, Instagram TV, Instagram lives, don't go for perfect. Perfect is not a thing guys. Be transparent. That's what people want to see more and more. Just marketing has shifted overall. I'm not going deep here. People want to see transparency. They want to see the story behind the scenes. People understand that these perfect billion dollar brands, you know, a lot of times they screw people over. So you don't want to be compared to them, do you? So, but I, I appreciate the inside Liz. Um, great. Um, let's see, Megan, a question on the grant. Uh, it was actually, you know, when you mentioned if it's not complete, um, will it, and it won't be reviewed. Someone's asking if they just missed a single like checkbox, will the city maybe reach out and ask them about that? Yeah, great question. And and that's what I'm attempting to do is that, you know, as stuff is received, try and peruse it. And if somebody, you know, inadvertently skipped a question or um, forgot to upload the one required piece of documentation, I'm going to try and get to them. Um, hopefully the day they submitted, but if not before the deadline on Friday so that they can make a resubmission. So um, know that I'm trying to do that. I think maybe the other clarification along with that is that when you press submit on the form, the web form, because it's a web form of the city's website, you'll it will take you to a submission page and it'll say, you know, thank you for your submission. It does note that that is not the verification that, that you checked all the boxes. So it is just a, you know, your, your form is being submitted to the person who's going to look at it. So, um, but I will try and reach out to everyone that I see. It looks like they had an inadvertent skip. Beautiful. Uh, then another question on, on that same lines is, will the grant be available to nonprofits who do not file sales or use tax with this city? So uh, the best, so there are different factors of, of eligibility and, and I just encourage people to go on and to read those and, and see how they apply to your business. Um, I don't want to inadvertently um, think I'm interpreting someone's business correctly when I may not have all the details to make that judgment. You know, we've really tried to design the form to give that information in a fact-based way that staff can review very objectively. Um, so there are eligible business types, and if you're not one of the nine business types, then you're not eligible to submit. So that's sort of, that's the, I think if, if you think about, so the big eligibility factors are brick and mortar business in the city of Louisville, um, that you were operating as of March 10th of this year, um, that you're current on all of your city accounts, so you're up on your sales tax, your use tax, um, utility accounts, that you have 25 or fewer full-time equivalents and that you're one of nine business types. And those business types um, are correlated with your business license with the city. So uh, a tie there is if, if you're, a, you, you gotta be a licensed business within Louisville and that business license should tell you whether you are one of those nine types. If someone has a more specific, am I one of those nine types? Um, we have short descriptions on the website that might give you a little bit of indication or people can email me and if I don't know, I'll get in touch with our sales tax department to find out. Beautiful, thank you so much, Megan. Well, Mark, um, if you have any questions um, uh, for any of the panelists, then I know we're already a ways over what we are, we're planning, um, but that those are the main questions that have come in. Oh, wait, let's see. Sorry, um, Megan, while you're speaking, someone asked, are self-employed with no employees, are they eligible? So that really, I think that falls under brick and mortar. So if you're not a brick and mortar business, if you don't have a physical you know, business presence that's open to the public, that would be, that's probably the checkpoint on being self-employed. So, so self-employed would, would generally to me mean home-based business um, and home-based businesses are not eligible. But again, if you have a business license, you should definitely check that against the eligible business types. Okay, great. Yep. And then um, Kathy just expand on her previous question for the, that it's a specifically a nonprofit preschool. So it sounds like she would fall into the educational service category. Yep. She should just check out the, the web form and, and check that against her business license. 
Perfect. Thanks so much. Yeah. On to you, Mark. Um, thank you, Wayne, for taking a look at all the questions and uh, fielding them and sharing them with our panelists today. Uh, I'm so thankful to have um, the city's support on this uh, great initiative. There's two more webinars coming up. Um, next week is on the whole concept of the pivot and as well as the following week is on social media and tools and technology. So definitely tune into those. I definitely want to thank Melissa and Liz and Andy for sharing your personal war stories through this really unusual time. Uh, it was just great to hear the things that you did to pivot, the tools and techniques and how you've been communicating with your customers and constantly just listening into them and engaging them. Uh, so thanks guys for joining. Any closing comments from you guys? So well, let's make that a wrap for today. Thanks to all of you for tuning in and uh, we'll check you out uh, on the next week's webinar series. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome.